happenings in Manchester. They're campaigning for a couple of buses, but I'll let her tell you more about that. We've also got Emily Yates. She's from the Association of British Commuters. Um, and I'll let you tell more about that as well. Before I go on, though, um, I just I want to make this kind of more about what you have to say to us and shaping a campaign. And we've invited um, our two speakers here today so we can learn from their campaigns as well and share knowledge and kind of build solidarity across with other campaigns. I think that's very important for us. Um, to network and build the campaign across there. Um, so some of the things we're going to do this year, uh, we've mentioned we'll be campaigning for free public transport for COP, uh, during, um, for COP coming up to COP. Um, we believe this will also benefit, so, like, have benefit social inequality as well as bringing down emissions and stuff like that. So we're going to be doing that alongside the campaign <coughs> against climate change who had their event upstairs today. Um, so that's something we're going to be mobilising around. Um, we just believe that public transport is for the people to help us move around, um, not for profits and shareholders. And that's why this year we'll be pushing even harder for regulation of our buses and for integration across the entire, entire public transport network. So once the speakers um, have said um, that their pieces, what we want to do is open up the way of discussion um, for questions and also just for what you want to see from us as a campaign this year. I know everyone probably has different opinions on what they want us to be focusing on, so it's always good to hear from you. Um, so we can shape the campaign and hopefully build it even bigger next year. Um, so I'll hand it over to Pascal, who's going to start. Um. Hi everyone. Uh, I don't have a slideshow, so you get to look at the petition the whole time <laughs> and uh, you can sign it. A uh, huge action for you. So thanks so much for having, having me. Um, I'm obviously Pascal and I work on the Better Buses for Great Manchester campaign. We're a coalition of passengers and staff from all across the region that are campaigning to improve our buses and bring them into public control. So buses make up around 80% of public transport journeys in Greater Manchester. They're the backbone of our city region, but they're just not up to scratch currently. Fares have gone up 55% in the last 10 years across the UK, and 8 million miles have been cut from our network in Greater Manchester since 2010. That's about 11% of our network. We Own It is an organisation that was set up to campaign for public ownership of public services. We've had several victories, including winning our campaign to stop the privatisation of NHS professionals a few years ago, helping to stop privatisation of the land registry, uh, a victory on the East Coast Railway line with others, of course, and most recently succeeding in our campaign to get probation brought back into public ownership. They set up the Better Buses campaign um, after unfortunately failing in getting the government to allow public ownership of our buses in <coughs> England. Um, However, we've still got a real opportunity to completely change our network in Greater Manchester and set a precedent for the rest of the UK. Um, so, most people I speak to are baffled that the current system doesn't let our local authorities have any control over the bus networks. A lot of people ask, why isn't transport up to scratch? Why aren't authorities doing their job and letting us uh, live our lives? The simple answer is the system doesn't let authorities have any control over the bus networks. Most bus networks are deregulated, except for a few pockets where you have publicly owned buses, Edinburgh, and uh, publicly controlled, so London and Jersey. Deregulation, which happened in 1986 under Thatcher's government, means that private bus companies set their own fares, routes, tickets, and timetables. They have their own individual ticketing structures as well. And local authorities have no control over commercial services, which is 80% of services. It leaves us with no say over fares and routes, and the remaining services are subsidised by our local transport body um, at times and in places where the local authority, or rather where the private bus companies won't run a service. It's not profitable for them. So this means in practice that bus companies are cherry picking the most profitable routes taking home millions and leaving us to subsidise the rest at a price that they set. £89 million pounds was given to bus companies in Greater Manchester last year alone. It makes up, our public money makes up 40% of their income. <coughs> so the opportunity to transform our buses uh, comes from legislation passed in 2017. And this means that Combined authorities with an elected mayor, like Greater Manchester, can regulate their buses. Re-regulation means that local authorities plan the network, <coughs> they specify the routes, the fares, the ticketing, and they give bus companies contracts to run services to our needs. It means that you can fully integrate the timetables with trams and trains, um, and it means that private company, companies compete for those contracts. 
Um, and this is how I, as I said, it's done in London and Jersey. It means that Transport for London, for example, can use profits from busy routes to pay for socially necessary routes. It means that if bus companies underperform, they can offer the contract to another company in future. You can also offer rewards if they do well. Lastly, it means uh, that you can integrate buses into a comprehensive network, real-time information with one source. And that's because one local authority, the transport authority, is planning the network. Not last or least, it allows Greater Manchester to have a simple smart card ticket like the Oyster card. And this means that you could cap it, you can use it on any bus, tram or train, um, and it guarantees the best price for the passenger. The current deregulated system makes this cooperation impossible. And where these voluntary schemes have existed, they've not worked. Some of you may have seen the Yorkshire Post advertise recently that their smart ticket that was going to work all across the Northwest that they've been talking about for years isn't going to work because the bus company is like, nah, thank mm. you. We like our systems. <laughs> um, London's buses were never deregulated in the 80s because this was deemed too risky. London's buses had to be stable and consistent. Their economy was important. So while bus use there has doubled since the 80s, it's fallen in Greater Manchester by 40%. The original justification was that competition would reduce prices and increase all of the buses that were on our streets. But what we've seen is that this hasn't happened. In Greater Manchester, 37% of job seekers say that transport is a barrier to accessing work. In a recent report from the Joseph Roundtree Foundation, one interviewee from Harpay said, with cleaning jobs early morning, there's no transport. You simply cannot get there. Uh, my friend Maria has to walk into Manchester every Saturday at 4 a.m. to get a bus to start her, uh, her cleaning job at 6 a.m. Um, Sheila called me a few months ago saying, please get me on the news. I have to rely on my neighbor every week so that I can do my weekly shop. There's no <laughs> bus that goes on my estate anymore. Um, 69% of people want their local councils to be the decision makers on their buses. People want their buses to be run for their communities over profit. They know that what we have right now is not working. We know that what we have right now is not working. So clean, affordable, accessible, 24 hours a day. What's really interesting to know is that while London's buses um, really delivers for passengers, their profit margins are lower for the, for the companies. In London, bus companies make around 4%. In deregulated areas, it's reported as 8%. But if you, people inside the industry tell me all the time, it's much more like 15, 20%. And I think that when you see the difference between the profit margins, you start to see why bus companies resist public control and public ownership of buses at, at every chance they get. We recently released research recently, a year ago, recently, uh, which showed that shareholders were pocketing uh, 18.4 million in the Northwest, that's a year, and that amounts to 1.49 billion over the past 10 years. But our communities cannot afford to have radically improved buses. We need better buses because they're transformational, they boost economies, they, pe they boost our access to jobs and opportunities, they improve our air, and they allow us to access services, and most importantly, see our loved ones. When transport is the biggest sector contributing to greenhouse gas emissions, um, they're a vital part of the solution. And this was really heartening, actually, to see in the election climate debate. Corbyn mentioned that regulation of buses is crucial. Um, Re-regulating bus networks also has the ability to save money. The Transport for Quality of Life uh, report showed 340 million a year. Um, and that's because bus companies are asked to deliver more for smaller but more predictable profit margins. And in Jersey, where they have regulated buses, that it's saved 800,000 a year for them, whilst they've ma managed to increase bus ridership by 32% in the last five years. We have to use public money more efficiently for buses over shareholder dividends. Of course, the only way to eradicate buses run for dividend completely is to bring them into public ownership. Uh, this means that all your profit can, of course, be reinvested back into the services. And we need this cash, right? We've got green buses to pay for, staff pay increases, um, we need more buses per hour for it to be a viable alternative to the cars. However, as I've already mentioned, it's illegal to bring your buses or to set up a new municipally owned operation in England. But of course, there's a strong case behind this being ideological. Nottingham and Reading have the second and third highest number of bus passengers uh, per head. And the Independent Transport Commission has showed that bus use has fallen by 15%, 15%, sorry, in the last 10 years. 
Uh, Nottingham has won the best bus operator at the UK Bus Awards for several years in a row. And public operations lead on innovation and investment. Oyster is and was a world leading uh, innovation. And how was that done? Because a public body was able to integrate all of their transport and was able to say this investment will be worth it and we can have control over that. Lothian bought loads of new, uh, they bought 100 seater buses and in 2017 they returned six, did I say 16? In 2017 they returned six million back to the purse to reinvest, the public purse to reinvest in trams. Um, and Nottingham also introduced 67 new biogas double deckers in April 2018. Edinburgh's publicly owned bus company was voted in a passenger survey as the best value for money. And of course, in London, we've got £1.50 fares, but, which is well known. However, a lot of people don't know that that's because the mayor was able to do a four-year price freeze in these hard times. We're really impressed with your success here in Scotland to get publicly owned buses. It's really buoyed us in England, and we want to offer all the help that we can to get these powers enacted. While it's illegal in England, we want to work to get tangible changes on our buses. That's why we're working to get public control and working with people who currently do not have those powers to get those powers and shift the conversation to the next steps. So um, I was asked to speak about some of the tactics that we've used in Greater Manchester to build support um, and try and get the mayor to listen to us. He's the decision maker. And so I apologize for saying things that you already know and you're probably using in your fantastic campaign already. But um, Number one, in Greater Manchester, we've pulled together a broad coalition of groups to build passenger power. Um, I would say that this has been a huge reason for our success. Um, we have unions, environmental groups, academics, cycling groups, citizen pa participation groups, activist groups, older people's networks, um, and of course policy groups with a strong badge of respectability, which we appreciate them lending and sharing with us. I would encourage anyone doing bus campaigning to meet with lots and lots and lots of people big and small groups, and have unusual allies in your pack. Um, go to community groups and give talks, and if people are excited, invite them to be involved by giving them a project or inviting them to an organising meeting. Number two, I would say that we own it always bases campaigning on evidence bases and being thoughtful. Build your evidence base and take time to look at helpful research to have killer, unobjectionable facts. Twitter is very helpful for refining your arguments and make sure that you always try to have an answer for everything. Um, some of you may have seen me on my phone just then, it's because the bus companies just spend their time trying to pull us down on Twitter. It's like, if you spent as much time trying to run a decent bus network, maybe you would have all these problems. Um, so, um, three, our campaigns also come, all, always must come from all of the areas affected. This is a big part of our coalition. We have people involved from all areas and we constantly give people opportunities to get involved and skill up giving talks in their local areas. We have people that have self-organised so much, it's amazingly impressive. People give, uh, they do events like Better Buses Bingo, Better Buses Badge Making, um, all sorts. Uh, number four, when you have events, always try to make sure that people have an action so they feel empowered and like they're part of your campaign, that the solution is already being worked towards. Our first uh, public meeting used the Barnstorm model, which is technically defined as a political tour across the country. But what makes it so special is that you use the energy that you've generated that room, uh, in that room, in that meeting, to get people to take really big actions. Um, it was a tactic used in the Sanders campaign. Uh, 1,000 Barnstorms were held, seven, 650 by volunteers, and this led to 75 million calls being hosted, uh, being made, sorry. Um, and in the book Rules for Revolutionaries, Zach Exley and Becky Bond talk about how this was a crucial part of the campaign. Um, our Barnstorm at our public meeting asked people to pledge right there to meet their local council leader on a bus um, and talk to them about their problems. I and friends of mine who I spoke to when preparing were like, oh, that's a bad idea, man. You're going to get this empty room. No one's going to volunteer. Um, I would never volunteer for something like that in a million years. But quite the opposite. Despite it being a wet Wednesday evening in February, we had people there from all 10 local authorities and someone volunteered from every local authority to go and do this brave action. They organised right there and then with people they'd never met before. And it was really amazing to see. Um, 
Number five, going back to the evidence. Make sure that people are getting information about what you're doing and your arguments too. We, got, we spent a good chunk of time doing research to show that the bus company shareholder profits were mwad. Um, uh, and it gives people the real story as well. You know, we want to be fighting in our communities, but the media is a key part of this too. Build relationships with journalists who have covered that area. We're lucky to have a few journalists in Manchester who understand that buses actually affect people's lives um, and hi highlight the problems with the current system and always show the solution. Six, be creative. We made a bus to walk with uh, for our petition hand in. Someone then emailed us and showed us a bus that they'd made in 1971 for their bus protest, which was well cool. Um, but we like to be creative with videos as well. We've developed um, our persona for the shareholders, which is the fat cap, and we do videos from the perspective of the, the shareholder fat cap as well. Number seven, always try and target the decision maker. We always try to think what will influence him? What pressure will this put on him? And number eight, uh, get as much knowledge as possible about the organisations and the people you're uh, targeting. Understand their culture, their lives. So, why do all of this? Why is public control uh, worth fighting for? It's not as good as public ownership. Let's just wait until that's legal, right? The alternative to bus regulation is partnerships. Partnerships are voluntary offers where the bus companies say they'll give a little bit and the local authorities do. They continue to choose uh, when they'll run buses, what fares they'll charge, etc. When they were offered a legal framework for their voluntary offers in Manchester, they turned this down. And in their partnership offer, one bus, who, uh, whose raison d'etre is to be my arch nemesis, yeah. <laughs> say that they will not run services unless they are commercially viable. This means that bus companies will continue to run buses for profit. And this will mean that our communities are left isolated and without <coughs> services. Currently, there are over 160 ticket types in Manchester. Mm -hmm. If you can find me someone in London that doesn't know about the Oyster, I'll buy you lunch personally. <laughs> because their buses are in public control, London can demand that those running the buses fulfil our needs as citizens. TFL is in the driving seat. For example, in central London, um, by 2019, all double-deck buses were meant to be hybrid in central London. Uh, in March 2019, 19, 90, sorry, percent of buses were deemed highly polluting. While 1,200 a year are submitted to hospital for asthma in Greater Manchester, when an idea of uh, a tax on highly polluting buses came up, the bus companies came out and labelled this a passenger tax, suggesting they, that they would have to pass this charge on to us. This was whilst uh, Stagecoach South Manchester's profits went up 14% to 17 million in 2018. We need to be able to set the standards and regulation forces bus operators to give us what we need. It's crucial to getting a decent bus network for our communities. In Greater Manchester, we've already seen some interesting tactics used by the bus companies to quieten calls for regulation. They say that it's gonna cost 70 pounds per household when the independent report showed that that was completely inaccurate. Um, they did adverts on the back of buses. You might not use buses, but with franchising, you'll pay for them. With public control, you'll pay for them. Mm -hmm. Despite the fact that, as I already mentioned, 40% of their revenue is our money. Mm -hmm. But this isn't working with people. 76% of people in Greater Manchester want their buses to be in public control. Mm -hmm. And research by Abellio um, showed that 95% of people support subsidising routes for the public good. Um, people are nice, man. Um, <laughs> we know that we have a problem when our friends and family can't get out of the house because the service is too expensive and unreliable. We know that we have an environmental and an air pollution crisis. We know that we need a great service to get people out of their cars. We know that we need better buses and it's worth the short time investment. We cannot afford not to regulate our buses. And so my hope is that we can succeed in March in getting Andy Burnham to listen to us as citizens and bringing our buses into public control. Um, thank you so much for listening. I can't wait to hear your questions. Thank you.